So now we're going to dive into the notion of abstractions. We're going to take an interface and kind of compare it across a number of different languages. We're going to call this abstraction a map. A map is a common term that we use kind of abstractly to describe key value collections. And each different language tends to have a different name for that. C++, they actually call it a map. Python calls it a dictionary. Java also calls it a map, but with an uppercase. And in PHP, we call it arrays. And in JavaScript, they're actually objects. And then we're going to look at the iterator pattern as an abstraction for looping across multiple implementations. So let's take a look at some sample um, Python code that's playing with a dictionary class. So we created dictionary at the very beginning. Then we fill it up with some uh, key value pairs. And so you'll notice that like d sub z equals 8 and d sub z equals 1. That's got to be a replacement. So, so there's no 8 in there after that second uh, replacement. We then print it. Then we do a get of z to see if it's there. And then we do a get of x and it's not there. So we see x equals 42 when it executes. Then we say give me an iterator of the items in this dictionary. And so what that basically is going to do is, an, is the iterator itself is not a list. In earlier versions, like Python 2, when you ask for the items, you tended to get a fully filled out list, but that's a waste of memory. So the iterator is simply a data structure that is keeping track of where in the list we are, and then we call it next over and over and over to advance through the iterator. So we don't have to make a complete copy of all the data. We just have a little pointer that advances through. So items is a relatively small data structure. I mean, it doesn't include all the data in the dictionary. It just is itself a pointer to something. It's all internal. Remember, abstraction is like, hey, I can give you the next thing. Internally, there's pointers and all kinds of crazy things inside these iterators, which we shall soon see. So if you print out items, you will see that it's like an item iterator for dictionaries. That's what that class dict item iterator is telling us. But then we can call the next function, which is built into Python, and say, hey, iterator, do your job and hand me back the next thing. Or if we've let, reached the end of, of the dictionary, false. Now, it can come in any order. These have any ordered dictionaries, of course. Um, but we get back the entry, or we get back false. So we say while entry, then we print the entry, and then we say, hey, give me the next one, and then loop up to the top. And when it becomes false, we're all done. And so what you see, because this is an ordered dictionary, is you see Z1, X9, B3, A4, and then it finishes. So this, we've not, we don't know about next, arrow next. We don't know even the, in this case, we're just getting a tuple back. So we do know that. But if we take a look at this same kind of concept in PHP, uh, we make an array and we fill it up. Z gets to be 8, Z gets to be 1, and that's an overwrite. And then we put three more things in, and we can print them out. And we see that it's kind of an ordered dictionary, as it were. X, Z, Y, B, A. And then we do a get, and we're using the null coalesce operator, which is the double question mark. So we say, give me A sub Z, and if that doesn't exist, then give me back 42. So it's kind of like a get, but that's a that's a PHP 7 and later. So we look up uh, x and we don't get it, so we see x equals 42. And then we run through an iterator. And again, there again, there's structures inside of arrays, but we know nothing about how PHP implemented the arrays. We just know that if we say for each a as key is assigned to value, we can print out k and v. And so this is a very abstract way of saying, I want to go through all of them. I want the keys and values. Give those back to me, but I don't care how you do it, whether you make extra copies of data, etc. So that's another iterator pattern. Now in C, the data structure we create is a map. And if you read this, you'll see that it talks about how the implementations work, etc., etc., etc. But the C++ equivalent of a dictionary is in effect a map. And so this is some C++ code. The first thing we see is we're going to create a map, and in this less than greater than syntax, you're seeing that the map is mapping a string to an integer. So the key in this case is a string and the value is an integer. The previous two languages didn't care so much about types. And so that's that's why they, but now we're in C++, which cares greatly about types. 
And so now we say mp sub z equals 8, then mp sub z equals 1, which again is a replace operator. Then y, b, and a are set to 2, 3, and 4 respectively. And, um, and then we do like a get operation. And this one is a little funky in C. Why they didn't give us a get operation, I do not know. But what this is using is a ternary operation. It's saying mp count. How many z keys are inside this thing? And if it's greater than 0, we print out mp sub z. And if it's, if it's not greater than 0, or if it's 0, then we print out 42, which functions like a Python get on a dictionary. So this syntax is funky. You can go like Google it. There's just no, it's like there's two ways you can do it, and neither of them makes me particularly happy. Because I think that for a map-like object, a get, a get with a default is uh, pretty valuable. Um, the notion of running through and counting means you found it or didn't find it. And if you found it, why don't you give it back to me? But they just don't have a get. But now we see an iteration. So it says for auto. Auto is a type, but it's an automatic type, and it knows um, that this um, MP is a map string int, and so it creates this current pointer, which is a pointer to not exactly a map, map string, it's a map entry. But we don't have to care about that. There's, a, there's actually a type. Cur, the variable cur, has a type. Whatever the MP begin is going to give us back as a type, and it knows that based on map string int and it makes cur the right type. So this is like whatever type you want, but it is not any type. It's a very precise type, and that's a, that's a sort of a hallmark of C++, is all the types are very, very precise. So it's a for loop. You see the three semicolons? The initializ initialization clause, auto cur equals mp begin, says, hey, we've got our iterator. Get me started. Begin. Go to the beginning of it and give me the first one. And as long as cur is not equal to mp end, the, 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 the end, there are no more. That's kind of like they're null. Um, and then plus plus cur. So we're incrementing cur. And then there's a key and a value. And they don't call them key and value. They call them first and second. That's the thing coming back from mp begin has a attribute first and an attribute second. And we call the c underscore str to convert that to a c string. So I can use printf so I don't have to use c out just because, I don't know why, I didn't want to see out in this one. But you see an abstraction where the first and the second are known, but because this is a key and a value, it's not such a big deal. Okay, and so that's doing the same thing in C++. In Java, they have a interface, and you see the word interface here, an interface named map, less than, greater than, k comma v. And, and just like in C++, this is saying a map is a key and a value, but what we're putting in here is the type of the key and the type of the value. So we're going to make a map that has a string key and an integer value. You might say, why didn't I do string string? And that's because it makes it just easier when I'm writing so much C code. Um, it, it also will be fun when we actually count things, if you remember. From a long time ago, we did counting. But map is the class, and string integer, there's the, um, this is kind of polymorphism where it can be a map that maps strings to integers or integers to strings or strings to strings or who knows what to who knows what else. Meaning this map is exceedingly flexible and it doesn't care what kind of type it's, it's using as long as the type meets some basic criteria. So here's a bit of Java code that does the same thing that we've been doing. And so we see that we're going to make this variable map lowercase is of type map, map of strings to integers and we're going to create a new tree map of strings to integers. And the new creates a new object. Now the difference between a map and a tree map is a map is an interface and a tree map is an implementation. The tree map says we're going to build this key value store but we're going to store our data in a tree and that says to a computer scientist that it's going to have a certain performance and memory footprint. Trees are a great way to store key value data. Um, but they, they're, they take a little bit more memory than a linked list, as we will later see. Um, and so we're, we're choosing an implementation. The other thing where it says tree map that you might use is what's called a hash map, which is a simpler map implementation, but doesn't keep things in order. So you can choose. The map doesn't change, but it, you can say, I'd like this to be a tree map or a hash map. They're both key value stores, 
One is an ordered key value store, and a hash map is an unordered key value store. And they both have different performance behaviors and internal implementation details. But it doesn't matter because they're both maps. And this code that we write, we could literally change tree map to hash map, and the code would work exactly the same, but the order of the key value pairs might be a little bit different. Now you'll notice that when we're putting stuff in, we call, we call a method map.put. So everything we've seen so far says like map open bracket quote z quote close bracket equals 8. Java chose not to do what's called operator overloading and so it really does everything in a method. So the kind of things that you think are going to be done with an assignment statement or uh, some other syntax tend to be done. It's like okay we're going to do everything with methods and parameters. Now map is the object instance that's being worked on and z where that's basically saying map sub z equals 8. And we'll do an input of z1 which is going to overwrite. You'll see I'm doing the same thing in each one of these things. And then put in y, b, and a with 2, 3, and 4 respectively. I can print it out and if you look at the printout it looks a lot like what it looks like in Python. There's this thing called get or default. Map dot get or default which is you know, if the key Z is in there, give it to the value, or just give me 42 as a default. And in the first case, Z is there, and the second case, X is not there, so you see X is 42. That's not a bad name for it. It's a little more verbose than get. It's pretty much the same as what we do in Python. And then we have an iterator. And now you see in this for loop, you see kind of the notion of the fact that the iteration variable is has a type. So we don't have this auto. Later versions of Java may have an auto, but now I'm explicitly showing you. It's not a map string integer, it's a map.entry, which is an entry inside of a map. It's an abstract interface to the entry inside of a map. Each entry that's got to match the string integer that's in the map. And so there's a map string integer, which is the whole map, and then there's a map entry, which is one of the entries. But this map entry is also kind of an iterator, right? So we're going to iterate and move forward. So it's not just the key and the value. It's really the key and the value and the position. But we don't see the position. All we know is we keep, we use this for syntax, which is kind of like a for in in Python. And we call map.entry set, which is I want a set of all the entries. And that map entry set does not construct a giant in memory list and then go through it. That actually creates a single map entry with the key and the value of the first one and then you hit it again and it gives you the second one. You hit it again, it gives the third one and pretty soon it gives you null which means that the loop is going to stop. And the entry itself does have a key and a value. Now key and value are known in the map entry interface so you say entry.getKey and entry.getValue. Now that they're using um, methods to give us back the key and the value versus in the previous things you saw attributes being used in the iterators. And that's because Java is obsessed with preferring to use accessor methods like getters and setters versus just grabbing attributes. And the key thing is, is they can add just a little bit of business logic if they want rather than having to do something and then have the key and the value already completely computed sitting in an attribute for you to use. Entry get key. Sometimes it just grabs something that's already got computed or it might actually go do something or do some work. And so by putting these things in what they what Java calls getters and setters. In this case we're not seeing a we're not seeing a setter so much. Um, but making it so that instead of it being entry.key, it's entry.getkey open paren close paren. That's a very Java way of thinking about this. So we started by talking about a simple Python dictionary where we fill it up, we use get, then we create an iterator and then we abstractly loop through that iterator. And that's what we wanted to accomplish in this section, just to see how that is done in a wide range of different languages. Because the map abstraction is kind of like this thing that we use as software developers, and then it's a, a kind of a sealed thing, and then underneath it all the magic happens.